Hello and welcome to the She Reads Romance Books podcast, the ultimate show for romance book lovers looking for the best books worth reading. I'm your host, Leslie Murphy, and in each short episode, I share my favorite book list of recommendations so you know exactly what to add to your must-read list. Join me as I explore the romance genre and have fun collecting book boyfriends along the way, because life is better with a love story. All right. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the She Reads Romance Books podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, someone who I think does it all. Not only is she a romance book author, but she is a screenwriter, a podcaster, a teacher, and we are going to talk about all of those things, plus her debut novel, The Plus One. So welcome, Sarah Archer. Hi, Leslie. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So when I saw the plus one and I read the book summary, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to talk to this author because I think the setup of this book and probably my obsession with, you know, romance heroes and book boy friends, I was like, I need to talk to her about it. So for those who maybe aren't familiar with the plus one, can you tell us all about it? Yeah, yeah. So this this book boyfriend is a little bit different. So the book takes place in Silicon Valley and the main character is this robotics engineer named Kelly. She's very smart. She's great at her job. She loves her work. She makes these kind of very realistic humanoid robots. That's kind of her specialty. But her personal life is a little bit of a disaster. She's always single. Her mom is kind of always on her back about trying to find someone and settle down. And when her younger sister is getting married, she is told in no uncertain terms that she has to find a date to bring for the wedding. She has to have her plus one. And she tries to meet people, you know, like in bars and online and and all the kind of traditional ways. All of it sort of flames out spectacularly, doesn't work out for her. So she finally (laughs) decides, you know what, I I make humanoid robots for a living. I'm just going to make a boyfriend. (laughs) So she (laughs) holds away in her lab and she makes up Ethan, who is not just her, you know, passable boyfriend but she decides I'm going to go out and all out and make him my perfect man because why not if you're going to make a boyfriend why not make him exactly what you think he should be so he's very good looking he can kind of know exactly what she wants she programs him to fulfill her every need he's sweet he's intuitive he's smart she does you know have to work out some of the kings as she goes and, and figures out some things that he's missing and has to kind of develop those but she gets away with it nobody realizes that he's not a human and, and she's able to pass him off as her boyfriend and have her plus one for the wedding but then the more time that she spends with him and the more kind of advanced that he grows and more like a human that he becomes over time she starts to actually develop real feelings for him and so then she's in a pickle because she needs to turn him (laughs) off and get rid of him because it's risking her career to have him around but she she doesn't want to get rid of him and so yeah that's kind of where the story goes oh my gosh I love it so much so (laughs) well let's start with how did you even come up with this idea you know, it's it's always, it's hard to know where ideas come from, right? Because sometimes mm-hmm. they just sort of like land on you. I mm-hmm. was living in LA at the time when I had the idea for this. And so I spent a lot of time sitting in traffic. And I feel like for me, it's always moments like that where I'm like, you know, driving on autopilot, sitting in traffic, in the shower, doing the dishes, things like that, where you're you're kind of doing something on autopilot and your brain can wander. That's when I get most of my writing ideas. And it was one of those moments I was driving to work, I was sitting in traffic and I just sort of thought like, oh, what if there was like a female robotics engineer who builds her perfect boyfriend? So the the main kernel of the idea was pretty fully formed from the beginning. And I was thinking of it as, do you know the movie Weird Science? The John yes. Hughes in the 80s? Yeah. So that one is broad raunchy comedy about these teenage boys who create a perfect woman and that one I think takes place all within maybe a day and a night and it's it's much more just kind of the hijinks of it and I I thought initially okay I want to do that in reverse but I knew right away that I would make it more of a a real relationship and like see these characters actually spend some time together and get to know each other so yeah I had the the main kind of idea sort of all at once of the the premise and then I went from there to think okay who are these characters going to be? Like what sort of woman would potentially do something like this? And who would I want to see go on that journey? Who would, you know, grow or change in some way out of that experience? Well, and I think I imagine you write in and probably read in a lot of different genres. Like Mm -hmm. what made you want to have sort of a love story be your debut novel? Or it just sort of happens that way. Yeah, yeah. It was it was sort of an evolution in that. I think I've always been 
very drawn to characters in my my reading and my viewing. I'm very much like, you know, obviously story matters. It's fundamental. But between the two, I tend to gravitate to strong characters the most. And that's what really draws me in. So I love interesting characters. I love relationship stories and seeing the kind of dynamics between characters, whether it's a romantic relationship or family, friends, any any kind of relationship between two people, I, I find really fascinating. And so I think I've always gravitated towards that in my writing. But I would I would not have called myself a romance writer starting out because honestly, I, I don't actually read that much romance. And I, I started reading more of it in the process of working on this and, and marketing it and that kind of thing. But I think I initially really thought of it more as a comedy because my background at that point was all in screenwriting. I had never written a novel before. And in the film and TV world, I would have placed this more as a comedy, but in books, that's not really a category. You know, you don't go to a bookstore and see a comedy section, maybe like humor for nonfiction, but in mm -hmm. fiction, they don't really have comedy quote unquote as a, a genre, the way they do in movies. So when I wrote this, I honestly knew nothing about publishing <laughs> and nothing about being an author and what that's like. And I was very naive about all of that and learned a lot as I went through. So I wrote it just kind of thinking like, okay, I'll just write a story. And, and I, I wasn't really thinking about genre or audience or that sort of thing. And when I started working with an agent, they, she and her, her assistant were, did a great job giving me notes and helping me develop it. And they kind of pushed it a little bit more in the romance, romantic comedy direction. And then when I signed with a publisher and did another round of revisions with my editor, it again kind of went a little bit further in that developing the relationship, the romance angle. And then when the, the publisher decided how to market this to an audience, they pitched it as romance, mostly for kind of marketing reasons because of the different buy numbers from different bookstores. So I, I sort of then found myself like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a romance writer now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I entered it like the back way, I guess you could say. But yeah, I've always been drawn to, to character and relationship stories. And I like to throw a little bit of humor in there too. So I like a, a good romantic comedy. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's talk about the heroine of the story. Like, have do you know any robotics engineers or you're just like, I'm just going to assume this exists and I, you know, what they do and we're going to make her create someone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is definitely not my, my area of expertise. I was an English major. <laughs> I, I do not know how to create a robot. So <laughs> this is not an instruction manual, um, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I, I did, I did get to interview a few people who work in um, robotics and engineering and, and AI in the process of working on this and researching it, which is really fascinating to me. I, I guess I'm sort of like an armchair enthusiast of that sort of thing. I don't really know anything about the technology behind it, but I find it fascinating. And, you know, even in, in the, the years since I initially wrote this and then published it, obviously things have changed so much in the real world with AI and the capabilities of that. So it's been interesting to see like certain things I wrote in this that maybe are coming more true or things that have changed beyond that. And I, I'm sure if I were writing this today, it would be pretty different. So it's, it's something that I think in real life, it's kind of scary in a lot of ways. <laughs> I wanted in this book for it to be light and entertaining and, you know, romantic and funny, but still also get at some, some real questions about kind of the relationships between humans and technology. But this is not like a sort of doom and gloom AI is coming to, <laughs> to take over sort of story. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I like too the premise of like her younger sister's wedding sort of being the impetus to this, because I think, mm -hmm. you know, some people are totally cool with being single. Some people have that familial pressure, like you need to find someone. And other people do want to find a partner, but just have a really hard time doing it. And so I love how she's just like, well, I'm just going to take things into my own hands and do it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wanted to build in some different layers there. I think it's important that for Kelly, she she not only is doing this just to fulfill expectations from her family and from society, even though that's definitely an element. But I want it to feel like on a deeper level, she actually does want love and connection. Maybe she's not that focused on like, I need a date for this event, or I have to be married by a certain age. But she is lonely in a certain sense. And so she has an, a real emotional need for some kind of connection that Ethan provides. And then also I had to kind of create the character of her mother to give some of that external pressure to her mom runs a, a bridal boutique and designs gowns and, and works in that industry. And she's, she has these very sort of traditional notions of love and marriage and family. And like, that's what a woman's life should look like. And you need to be married by the time you're 30 and these sorts of things that I think 
for Kelly and, and other people in her generation aren't as important, but her mom still puts a lot of that pressure on her. And then as, as the story goes on, Kelly sort of, sort of comes to a new understanding of her mother and sees some kind of dimensions of her that she didn't see initially. So I wanted them to grow in their relationship as well. I love that. I love that. Did you have fun thinking about the qualities that you wanted Ethan to possess and what those might yeah, be? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> there, I think there's one point where she, Kelly is, is making him and she sort of goes down a list of like, okay, here are, what are all the like bullet points of what I want my perfect man to be. He has to love dogs. He has to know how to do all these things. He has to like to travel and like food and he's a good cook and he's funny and, and all of these sorts of uh, things. And, and some of it she is able to program into him initially and some of it she has to kind of figure out on the back end, like the humor thing. That was something where she realizes like, okay, he has no understanding of, of what humor or sarcasm are and how do I teach an AI that, which I think is such an interesting question too, because it's something that is so, you can't pin it down. You can't define what makes something funny or what gives somebody their individual sense of humor. So I think in, in the real world too, that's going to be interesting to see, like, how do we, you know, develop that in an AI for, for writing and, and that sort of thing too. Yeah. And I think sometimes you do have your list, right? But then mm -hmm. when you're in maybe a relationship, you're like, oh, that's actually not as important, but this is, and I didn't realize it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot of what I, I think Kelly kind of learns in this too, is that you can't, you know, she's very type A, she's an engineer. She likes to engineer everything in her life down to the T and she kind of realizes like, you can't engineer a person, you can't engineer a relationship, you can't engineer mm -hmm. love. So much of it is intangible and indefinable and and real people are always going to be so complex and going to surprise you and that's part of the beauty of life that's what makes it sometimes challenging and scary but that's what makes it fun too yeah yeah and even though ethan is what sort of brought me to the story i like how i think you'd said too that through all of this she kind of learned and becomes the person that she's always wanted to be which i think is the ideal partner that you want to find who kind of makes you the, a better person as well yeah yeah exactly that's what i was going for and I, I want her to feel like she she goes on a journey where by the end of this she is ready to to find love and ready for a relationship in a way that she was getting um because she kind of heals some of her own wounds that are you know her own issues that she needs to work out before she can be yeah. with someone else. Do you give any example? I haven't read it yet, but I'm dying to read it. So do you give mm -hmm. any examples of like how disastrous her dates have been in the past so that you're like, I totally get why you're at this point? Yeah, for sure. There's there's a few scenes in the beginning where she decides to, to go ahead and make her man. She goes out with a guy who her mom sets her up with and she tries going out with a friend to some clubs and, and talking to people there and she tries online dating and it does not work well for her. She, she She's very awkward, which, you know, I I think that's a trait yeah. that I can sometimes relate to, but it's fun to write for sure, to give those kind of cringeworthy scenes. <laughs> well, it kind of made me think too about like this idea of online dating. Like I'm totally dating myself for it. I think it just started online dating when I was out of college and I think of Match was the only one mm -hmm. available where now there's like a plethora of options. But I feel like at least with online dating, maybe, you know, you can write your profile and then your what interests you to hopefully weed through you know mm -hmm. to find an ideal partner but I think sometimes like gosh even with online dating like create a whole lot easier <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> just, just make what you want <laughs> yeah exactly but it did bring up like this whole idea of like AI like you said that's become you know the buzzword and thing to talk about these days like this is a total aside but are you seeing AI like having a real influence in terms of writing and authorship these days or? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's something that, you know, it's it's changing so quickly. And honestly, like I I tend to be, even though I wrote a book that has to do with technology, I'm kind of backward technology. Like I'm I'm on the later <laughs> end of adopters. And especially with anything that has to do with writing, I'm like, it's such a, you know, the creative process is so delicate that mm -hmm. I would not, for me personally, I would hesitate to decide element that's kind of impacting how I'm thinking. And I know that there's a lot of worry about like plagiarism now and what does that even mean? And I've talked to authors who have had their work used to help feed things like chat GPT and help kind of educate the AI and, and their work was taken without their knowledge or their permission. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ethical issues around that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like using AI to just out and out write something for you, I would have issues with. I know some writers who use it kind of as a tool for like 
brainstorm me a list of different names for the character or title ideas or something like that. And I, I can definitely see the potential of it being useful in ways like that. But it's such a shaky, like, where do you draw the line between what's... Yeah, slippery slope. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. when does it become, this is no longer me writing this and my work versus a machine doing it? I don't know. I, I think that it's it's going to be interesting to see, too, like younger gen grew up with this technology, they're going to think of it in a very different way. And I also know now in the the film and TV industry, there's, I forget what the program is called. It's like Sora or something like that, but like a, a text to video generator where you can generate a video. You can say like, you know, show me a video of a woman walking through a field carrying a basket of flowers or whatever, and it'll create a video of that. And so people can potentially use that to create movies and TV shows on their own with no budget just by typing into a program. And, and they're taking meetings with that technology in Hollywood right now, which for me as a screenwriter too, it's like, okay, well, what does that do to people's jobs in that industry? So I don't know. It's, right. it's, it's also complex. There's a lot of exciting potential in the technology, but I kind of wish we could like pump the brakes and, <laughs> and think about these things as they roll out, but that's not going to happen. So we all just kind of have to figure it out as we go. Yeah. Well, you said this is definitely a rom-com. So is there a lot of comedy that you infuse into it? Yeah. So I know you have a sketch comedy background. Like, tell me all about that and how you got into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I definitely am not a comedic performer. <laughs> I like to say behind the scenes, I like to write. I did some sketch comedy in college, which was a really fun experience. And I think college was where I kind of found that I, I enjoyed comedy. I, I had always liked watching and reading things with humor in them, but I never prior to that, self as somebody who could kind of create comedy in any way. And then when I was in college, I, I did the sketch comedy group. And I also took some classes on screenwriting where I started writing more comedic screenplays and realizing like, oh, this is something that I, I really enjoy. And I think for me, the sweet spot is where you can have a little bit of both. I, I love something that has both some drama, some heart to it, maybe some darkness, but also some humor. And I think that when you can kind of combine those things and, and put them against each other, it casts both the drama and comedy into sort of sharper relief in a way that's really interesting. So I tried to do a bit of this in this story. There's some heart, there's some real issues, but there's humor in it as well. Some of which is generated by Kelly being a little bit bored, some of which is just the situations that come up when you have this robotic boyfriend who is, you know, not quite full yet <laughs> and you're taking him out into society and how does that work? But yeah, I think almost everything I write, I, I do write, well, some literary fiction that's more just pure drama. And I've written a couple of historical screenplays about darker times in history that are more dramatic. But yeah, I, I like to infuse at least a little bit of comedy into almost everything. I think it's just, you know, you need that in life, right? <laughs> Life is dark enough. Yeah. But you make it sound so easy. Like, I think that would be really hard to do, you know, writing comedy. But it is it is hard. And I think comedy performers, too, don't get enough credit. Like they say to to act in a role that has humor, you basically have to do everything that you would have to do in a dramatic role. But you also have to be funny, which is incredibly hard. And writing, too, you know, if, if you're writing something that's comedic, you want to still have a good story, good characters, all that strong foundation, but then also be funny on top of that. So I think mm-hmm. sometimes we we think of comedy as being easier just because we receive it in a way that's lighter, but to actually create it can be pretty complex, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So did I read that the this book is possibly going to be made into a TV show? Yeah, there's a production company that has the rights to it. So they're going to take it out and shop it around. Having worked in that industry myself, I know that it's always a, a long process. <laughs> and it's always kind of a long <laughs> shot to actually get something to the screen. So I'm not, you know, counting on that. But it's super exciting that they're interested in it. And I think as a I could see it either as a movie or a TV show. I think as a movie, obviously you take a book, which is a close-ended story like movie, and you could do a pretty faithful translation of it in that sense. But I also think it's really exciting to think about what it could be like as a TV series where you have more real estate to expand the story and to see the characters grow and evolve and to kind of respond to maybe some of those real world developments and technology as they're happening too. And uh, yeah, so I, I would be happy if they did that for a writer to crack it wide open and, and take the characters where they want to. Almost like a modern day, like Mork and Mindy. I mean, that's really dating myself. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love that though. Like a sort of odd couple mm-hmm. story um, where you have people who you wouldn't think are 
are compatible in some way, but then they kind of bring something out in each other. I, I love those sorts of stories. Yeah, absolutely. Well, do you think you'd even be involved in the screenwriting process if that came to be? Or You know, I, I would love to be. I think it really depends on who was developing it. But yeah, I would certainly love to at least do some consulting or that type of thing and give some input. Yeah, that would be awesome. Well, tell me more about like, how is screenwriting really different than, you know, writing fiction and writing a novel? I think they're they're both challenging in different ways. I think I was fortunate in that I did some screenwriting before I ever tried to write a novel because I think that helped me a lot with my fiction writing. A lot of writers tend to struggle with structure mm. and screenwriting forces you to be very structure minded and very kind of disciplined about figuring out exactly which beats are going to be there and, and thinking in terms of scenes and thinking in terms of action. Obviously, when you're telling a story in a visual way, you can't do the story. You're forced to, you know, show, don't tell, which is sort of the the dictum the writers hear a lot. And in a screenplay, you have to show. You you can't tell unless you're using voiceover, but you want to be kind of careful about not overusing that sort of thing. So it forces you to really think visually and to think of how how am I going to put the story into the action and the dialogue, mm-hmm. as opposed to just kind of narrating it to my reader. It also forces you to be very efficient. You don't have that much time to tell a story in a screenplay. So, you know, typically if you have a book that's adapted into a movie, everyone's like, oh, well, where did this scene go? And I loved that part and they took it out. You just don't have as much time to tell the story. So you have to really be judicious about what goes in there. I know for me, when I when I write a screenplay, I always tend to write long and have to cut things. And then it was really, really nice writing my first novel to be told like, oh, you you could add like maybe 5,000 words if you want to. You have some wiggle room. I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. So it's, it's nice to have that sort of breathing room. Uh, but obviously in, in writing prose, then you also have to think about the actual language itself and really what are you going to do with that and how are you going to develop the voices of the characters and the, the narrative voice, which is an extra challenge, but it's a lot of fun too. I, I love that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I think that they're they're different in a lot of ways. I think that any fiction writer can benefit from doing some screenwriting and learning about that and vice versa. It just kind of taps into different parts of your brain and your creativity. And I think that it can strengthen you as a writer to to be a little bit more well-rounded. Yeah, that's awesome. Having done both, are you drawn more to one or the other? Or is it more just where the work is or where the ideas come? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, I think a lot of it is just, you know, where where the opportunities are. And I think some of it is going by the idea. Some ideas I think naturally lend themselves more to being in a a screen format versus the book. But if I had to choose, like if you told me I could only do one for the rest of my life, I would probably pick novels, partly just because I, I love the actual writing. I love the actual words and you don't get to kind of play around with that as much in the screenplay. And also from a career perspective, there's more opportunity there. It's, it's, it's hard to get a novel traditionally published, but it's even harder to get Um, a film or TV show made. And also self-publishing is a great option too for writers. So if it was really nice to me when I was writing this to think like, okay, if I want to put this out there on my own, I can. Like I, I can make this a book and get it out to an audience. Whereas when you're writing a script, unless you have a ton of money, (laughs) you're not going to be able to produce something totally on your own. So you're kind of writing it thinking, okay, I'm just going to throw this out there into the world and maybe it'll land somewhere. So it's nice to know that you have a little bit more of that agency as a a novelist. Well, your book is traditionally published. Like, What was that Mm -hmm. publishing journey like and how did it even happen? I I did it very kind of, it was traditionally published and I did it a very traditional way. I sent out cold query letters to agents. I got an agent who is actually in London. It was about a year total, I think, from the time that I signed with my agent to the the time that the book was kind of ready to go because I did a round of revisions with the agent. Then they sent it out. Then I did a round of revisions with the editor. And then it was maybe another year from that point to when it was actually published. So then in that year, they were doing you know, copy editing and cover design and marketing and all that sort of thing. So I, it was definitely like a crash course in publishing for me. I, I went into it very green, not knowing, and I, I learned a lot as I went. So I'm totally grateful for the experience that in hindsight, there are some things that I would do differently with my next book. And I would be a little bit more proactive for one thing about promoting it, because I think I went into it with this sort of old fashioned notion of like, oh, I have a publisher, they do that. And that's not really true anymore. Okay. <laughs> you know, the, the author has to do so much of the legwork to promote a book. And so I think that I would be positioned to do that better the next time around. And I would be a lot more proactive about getting out there and marketing it myself. But yeah, it was it was definitely like, it was a great experience. It was an educational experience. And I'm glad that I got to got to see all of Gate because that's hard to do. 
Yeah, absolutely. So then what got you into sort of the teaching aspect and working with other writers, whether it's fiction, nonfiction or screenwriters? Yeah, that's something that I've just kind of fallen into by luck, I guess. I, I moved to the Charlotte area a few years ago. And when I came out here, I wanted to get involved with some of the local literary organizations right away. I've always found having a community as a writer to be very helpful and important, both to get feedback on my work and for networking and for just kind of emotional support too. <laughs> I think we as writers are helpful for each other. Writers and readers are such a strong community, I think, and, and there's a lot of support there. So I, I kind of jumped right in when I moved out here and, and got involved with different writers groups and different literary organizations. And over time, people would ask me like, hey, do you want to teach a class on screenwriting? Do you want to teach a class on how to network? Do you want to teach a class on, you know, principles of screenwriting that fiction writers can use, that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I kind of just I didn't seek out those opportunities, but they started coming my way and I, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, like I said, I'm somebody who likes to be kind of behind the scenes, behind my computer screen or my notebook writing. I'm not somebody who is not like a public speaker. So it's been a way that I've had to kind of push myself, but it's been rewarding. I really enjoy connecting with students and hearing about what they're working on and, and helping them hopefully in some way. And it's pushed me to, to think about my own writing and okay, if I'm, if I'm trying to tell somebody else how do you structure a story that makes me think about, well, how do I need to structure my stories? You know, so I, I feel like I'm teaching myself at the same time. Yeah. And it's, it's just been a really a fun way to meet people in the community too, who I wouldn't have met otherwise. Yeah, that's awesome. And I recently saw that you did a podcast episode on writing, publishing and book marketing lessons, right? From bestselling authors. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we probably have some aspiring authors who listen to the podcast. Like what are some of those gems that you pass on when it comes to writing, publishing or marketing? Oh, gosh. Yeah, there, there's so much that you could talk about. I think one thing, like I mentioned earlier with marketing, you really have to be proactive as a writer these days, even if you are traditionally published. Mm -hmm. I would say it's never too early to start thinking about that sort of thing. If you have any aspirations at all of publishing in the future, I, I've heard some writers say like, oh, I, I don't really need to start thinking about that or I don't need to start building community or networking because I haven't even finished my manuscript yet. I'm like, no, start now. You, you want to lay that foundation as early as you can. It's never too early to start building a community, making those connections, and also thinking about kind of your, your vision for yourself as a writer. You know, even if you don't have anything published, it's not too early to have an author website or to start a newsletter and start building those contacts and think about yourself as it sounds a little bit maybe pecuniary or crass, but thinking about yourself as a brand, I think is important for an author. And that was something that I kind of had to learn as I was going through the process too, because with screenwriting, the, the writer is not a sort of public facing quantity. Like you work with people within the entertainment industry, but people who are watching the movie or watching the TV show, they usually don't know or care who wrote it. So the, the writer's name in that sense doesn't really mean anything. Thing. Whereas when you're an author, your name is on the book and your name kind of becomes a brand. You think about like Stephen King or you know, Nora Ephron, any sort of writer who has a definable brand, you hear their name and you know kind of what they do. And then some writers will have pen names so that they can write in multiple genres. But you really have to think about what's my brand as an author? What do I want to go out there with? What do I want to position myself as? Which for me has been hard because I like to read and write and watch so many different things. I'm like, well, can I just kind of do all of it? <laughs> so having to kind of decide how do I want to position myself going forward has been a little bit tough. But you do need to think about not just what you're writing and how that's putting your brand out there, but how you're using social media. If you do have a website, how does that position you? You know, what sorts of readers are you attracting based on what you're putting out there? And even things like the, the graphic design of your website plays a role in that. So it's, yeah, it's, if you, if you have any publishing aspirations, you have to think of yourself, not just as a writer, but as kind of a business person. And that's a whole other skill set that you get to learn. <laughs> it is. I know. And just like you said, sometimes you just want to stay behind on the computer and get your stuff done. And especially if like you're an introverted type of person, but it does take a lot of marketing and what do you call it? Like engagement points to really work a success, I think, in this day and age. So, yeah. For sure. 
Yeah. And, and that's, I think that's challenging, certainly for me. And I hear a lot of writers say that too, like, well, I just want to write, like, can I just write and then have someone else make my book a bestseller? And I wish that I could do that. But, you know, the, the marketing end of it, it can be very time consuming for some people, especially if they self-publish, they put a lot of money into it. And it may not be always in your wheelhouse, especially if you are a more introverted writer like I am. But I will say like, it's fun. I mean, I get to do things like this, where I go on a podcast and I talk to a cool person like you and I, I get to meet readers and go to events and social media is kind of a mixed bag you know sometimes it can be traumatic <laughs> a bit of a trash fire but it can also be really fun and, and can be a great way to connect with people so the marketing end of things I think gets a little bit of a bad rap from writers where we're like oh I, I wish I could just write and I, I totally feel that but you can also kind of make the the marketing and publicity end of it what you want it to be and make it fun for you and make it what works for you there's so many different ways to connect with readers so many different ways to promote your book if something isn't working for you then do something else you know you, you can tailor it to yourself yeah. Well, before I ask you a few questions about Sarah, the reader, is there anything else you should tell us that we need to know about the plus one before everybody goes out and buys it to read it? Oh, gosh. I, I just hope that people enjoy the story. You know, that's that's my hope at the end of the day is that they're entertained by it, that maybe they think a little bit about their own relationships and their own approach to life. Yeah, I hope that it's a fun and entertaining read for people. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining me for this awesome interview. I really enjoyed talking with her about her book, about creating book boyfriends, as well as screenwriting and tips about writing in general. But our conversation actually continues where we talk about Sarah, the reader. You can tune into this exclusive extended interview and view it as a video when you join the She Reads Romance Books book club. Not only by joining the club do you have access to our monthly Zoom meetings, author Q&A sessions, and our book club community forum, but you'll get immediate access to all of my exclusive interviews with my podcast guests, including this one with Sarah. So visit shereadsromancebooks.com slash book club to join today. You don't want to miss it. That's all for this episode of the She Reads Romance Books podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and found some new books to add to your TBR list. If you did, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast app. It really helps me reach more romance book lovers like you, and I appreciate your support. If you're a book boyfriend collector like me, then you'll want to join my email list so you never miss a podcast episode or a new book list. Just visit shereadsromancebooks.com slash join and sign up today. As a thank you, I'll instantly send you my list of top 10 book boyfriends that will make you swoon. Trust me, you don't want to miss this list. Thank you for listening and until next time, happy reading.